back here on the unofficial Titans podcast, Stoney Keeley with a very special guest for you guys today. We are kicking off draft week here on the unofficial Titans podcast, and I can't imagine having a better guest for the job. Titans Twitter, if you are not following this man, you need to get on it as soon as this podcast is over. We've got Titans draft related tidbits coming out this week, positional rankings, the whole nine yards from the man himself from the Barnes University, Charles Barnes. Charles, how you doing today, man? Doing fantastic, man. It feels great to get to talking football after a busy day that entailed a lot of things that were non-football. So it's it's always good to you know get on get on the mic and talk ball with a fellow Titans fan. I'm with you, man. Well, before we dive into our conversation here today, let our listeners know how they can find you on social media and let them know what you're going to be working on this week. Absolutely. Um, you. Can- you can find me at BU underscore scouting on Instagram and Twitter. Um, just, you know, following and being happy about the draft week. I'm going to be dropping uh, rankings, my top 10, top 15, sometimes top 20 rankings, all things Titans draft related, who we should target. Um, then I have my own series, the 2021 War Room Reports, where just recently had ESPN's Teron Davenport on, um, having a, a select group of guys hop on talk about how they feel about the draft, certain position groups. Um, you're going to get, uh, you know, key, key information from those guys. Um, so you definitely want to tune in and follow. You're going to become way more smarter from listening to these, uh, these guys get on the mic. Yeah. I watched the, uh, the interview with TD earlier today. And uh, do you, I mean, do you think he has, has something for uh, Nico Collins or what? I mean, his name popped up like 18 <laughs> times in that conversation. My man has scouted Nico Collins. Absolutely. Um, you know, talking with Justin Mello earlier as well. I mean, he, he, he's a good interview. He's a good kid. He has a big personality. And when you, you know, when you have that kind of energy for football, um, it certainly rubs people the right way. So yeah, I guess that's a good thing. That's a good thing for sure. Well, Earlier in the offseason, you wrote a pretty extensive piece on how you would attack the offseason if you were in charge of the Tennessee Titans. Great work, my man. We didn't get the uh, the Carl Joseph to the Titans like we had we had chatted about, but uh, they're they're off to a hot start with Bud Dupree and Danico Autry. What do you make of the Titans' offseason plan so far and how they've approached it through free agency? Where do you where do you think this roster's at as we approach the NFL draft? Um, I think they pretty much hit everything that they needed to the degree that they could. Um, you know, J Rob, he's going to try to find the sure thing as opposed to like coming up with, you know, a, a intricate plan that kind of looks into the future. So he kind of got his guy in Bud Dupree. He got a, a, a guy that made sense in Danico Autry, um, a guy that makes sense in Josh Reynolds. I mean, he struck everything right, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, top flight edge rusher, it's going to get after the passer who, who, who knows, um, you know, who's been in this league, who knows what it takes to win. And then you got you a guy like Josh Reynolds at wide receiver who can fill in that role as a route runner and possession wide receiver while still having a contested catch ability. Um, you know, so he, he just fit, he went down his list and he, and he filled positions um, with players that you can trust. And that's really what it was. Um, you know, as you know, I would have went more multiple in the edge rusher category with more veterans. I think that allows you more flexibility in the draft um, to get other positions. But he he went that route. Um, I'm not I'm not opposed to the money spent either. Um, if these guys pan out, then you got a pretty good offseason. But if you if these guys don't pan out, then you're looking at another <laughs> 2020 situation. Yeah, then that's not a good situation to be in after Vic Beasley and Jadavion Clowney were uh, – uh, we'll, we'll be nice and say subpar to expectations in 2020. So what do you think of the, the free agent edge rush class that's still out there? Because we hear a lot that at this point you're not going to hear a lot about any signings. Teams are going to focus on the draft and then kind of fill in holes after the draft. Are there any free agent guys out there? Because I, I still think they could use a, a free agent veteran pass rusher to add to the rotation. Are there any guys out there that you've particularly got your eyes on for the Titans once the draft has passed? Um, there's just one guy, to be honest, and he, he always asks for a lot of money, <laughs> and that's Justin Houston. Um, mm. I mean, he's a guy that every 
where he goes, he, he elevates the edge of lock of film room. You know, he's a savvy veteran. He's going to generate pressures. He's going to beat, you know, offensive tackles in his one-on-ones. He's going to maul running backs and pass pro. And he's always going to cause disruption. And that's one guy, man. I'm going to cut through the fat and just say, you know, Justin Houston, if you don't get the guy that you want in the draft and you do have a little extra money you want to play with and Justin Houston's come down on that number, you got to go get him. There you have it. Justin Houston's still out there. So where do you think free agency leaves the Titans as we approach Thursday's draft? What do you think the biggest needs are for this team that remain? Um, I think that you got to get depth at the wide receiver position. Um, mm. There's a lot of uh, missing targets on this team since Johnny Smith has left. Sure. Uh, Corey Davis has left. Um, you know, Adam Humphreys has moved on. Khalif Raymond, although he wasn't used as much as he's gone. You know, you got you to gotta use this draft um, to, to get two, maybe even three wide receivers and kind of fill out that roster. And a lot of people may say, okay, you're going to get three first-year players, but that, that's why you scout. You know, you find guys that um, can be, you know, uh, easily easily acclimate themselves within this offense and, and provide big numbers. So let's start with the uh, the wide receivers then. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's talk about this class. Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddell, and Jamar Chase appear to be the class of the wide receivers this year. I've read a couple of, of analysts, and again, this time of year, you never know what to believe, if it's smoke screens, if it's actual reporting, but just reading mock drafts, and I know everybody out there just hearing the word mock draft is cringing. We're all tired of it at this point. We just want to get to the draft. But reading a couple of mock drafts that have said Jalen Waddle might fall to the 20s, seeing people say we're worried about Devontae Smith's frame, we're not going to draft him, he's going to slide into the 20s. Is there any chance in hell that either of those things happen on Thursday night and the Titans luck out and end up with one of these guys. This is not a chance. <laughs> there's, there's not a chance. Um, <laughs> there's not a chance. There's not a chance that either of those um, Alabama wide receivers are there. Um, I can't see it happening. They I can't them. either. Dude. Y'all just trying to get clicks out there. Absolutely. And it's, it's just... <laughs> You know, during this time, sometimes you sit back and you may think of, think about stuff too much. Um, yeah. Um, you got to think about what Jalen Waddle provides to a team. I mean, this guy can play on the outside because of his speed. Despite his size, his speed kind of makes him a different element. And a lot of people want to say Tyreek Hill. I, I kind of, you know, cringe at that sometimes. But I understand what they need, the usage. He can use like him. He's not necessarily like him. Um, and then you talk about Devontae Smith, one of the best, you know, as far as you know, tape to talent uh, players in this draft. You know, he's going to be a guy that's going to be transcended, more of a Z than an X, so off the line of scrimmage and move type of guy. But, yeah, there's not a team, 21 other teams that's going to be like, uh, yeah, no, nah, let the Titans get him. No, no I, I'm with you. I just, you know what, I thought maybe, Charles, you could just give me that glimmer of hope and just tell me, like, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. So that guy there that might, might follow us that, that you might like or or grow to like. Oh, that's a, that's a nice segue because I was going to mention the guys that are most often mocked to the Titans when people are mocking wide receivers to this team, Rashad Bateman, Kadarius, Tony, Elijah Moore, Mm -hmm. what separates this bunch from one another and, and who do you like best for the Titans? Right. Uh, I guess I'll start with Bateman since I had him in 2021. Uh, game plan um the the thing with Bateman is he's a guy that you look at his build you don't see anything special um you you look at the the game speed you don't see anything special but what he does do he's a guy that can go out there and win his one-on-one he's a smooth route runner um reminds me a lot of a a, a lesser explosive Stefan Diggs and Mm. Stefan Diggs was extremely uh, productive. He's been extremely productive his whole career. Uh, but, you know, Bateman is a guy that can go out there and uh, move the chains and as well as make contested catches because he does have that, that ability as well. And then you move on to Kadarius Tony, whose tape is, you know, top two or three in this class. Sure. Um, that's one year, one year of, of, of excellent production. That kind of makes you kind of, you know, make sure you study a little bit more. Um, 
he's a guy that's more of a street baller. Um, that's a term that we 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 Titans fans know because that's how Kendall Wright played. He's less he's less of a structure player. Um, great run after catch. He's a little bit bigger than you know Bateman and uh, Elijah Moore, um, just by a little bit in terms of weight. Um, he just seems like a guy that is extremely elusive, but less in structure. Um, and you know, with the ten- Tennessee Titans offense, that play action offense, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're quick give and go. Uh, you know, Ryan Tannehill is at the point guard position, and he's distributing it extremely fast. That's that's kind of how their offense goes. And then with Elijah Moore, I think you get a little bit of both of those type of players, which I sure. guess that gives gives away the answer of who I would prefer. Um, he can he's an extremely pro- uh, efficient route runner he can he provide you with yards after catch ability and then he just has that attitude and dog in him that's going di- to differentiate him from any other wide receiver because he really 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 wants it so Elijah Moore combines the elements of you know Rashad Bateman uh, and Kadarius Tony so Elijah Moore would be my selection if all three were available at that point so what do you think the philosophy should be at wide receiver? Because you look at the way Corey Davis played big physical wide receiver, good blocker. Is it as simple as, Hey, let's find another big physical receiver. That's a good blocker and just plug and plug in and keep this offense going. Or are you of the mindset that, Hey, it doesn't matter how we get the production. We just got to get somebody explosive and productive out there on the field to keep this offense going. Right. Um, I honestly go a little bit more nerdier and deeper into it. I look. Oh, at, let's hear it. That's what we're I here for. At, I look at. Um, I actually look at the opponents that we're going to play. Um, in, the, in the next season, so I, I kind of look at okay, what kind of corners do they currently have? What kind of defense do they run? Uh, sometimes I might go into the the year after, but I kind of go year by year. I look at the type of defenses we'll face. Um, and then I look at, I like variance. I like having an offense that's tough to deal with. So um, to your point or, or what you were trying to explain was, okay, if you have a big physical wide receiver like A.J. Brown, uh, Yak, um, then you try to get guys that compliment him. You know, you try to get, you know, for instance, Rashad Bateman. You know, you try mm-hmm. to get that's more sleek, um, you know, a little bit more of a technician. Um, you know, not necessarily a Yak monster, but can move the chains. And then that's your guy. You call him more of a zone beater or, or, or a chain mover. And then you want to get a speed guy, right? You know, somebody like a Dwayne Eskridge from, you know, Western Michigan. He's more of a speed merchant that can stretch the field that's going to allow lanes to be open for A.J. Brown and Rashad Davis. And so then, you're essentially building like a full toolkit at the wide receiver position. Absolutely. You want to be as unable, as unfallible as possible. You know, and a lot of people, they look at it at, at, in a linear perspective. Okay, Corey Davis, we had a top offense last year. Let's just find a Corey Davis clone. Yeah. You, every year is different. Every year is different. So you have to be at your best, right? Don't try to copy what worked because you never know if that's going to work again. Just try to build the best possible team that you can. Make make yourself as difficult to deal with as possible. And that's kind of how I attack it. I'm, I'm with it, man. I cringe every time I see somebody saying we got to find the next Corey Davis. Like maybe, maybe you don't literally mean it, but I'm like, no, we just got to, we got to get playmakers out there. We got to get guys that can just go out and make plays and keep the offense going. And I dare say maybe even kick the offense into another gear. Mm -hmm. So is it safe to say that that wide receiver is your greatest need for this team heading into the draft? I would have to say so. And it's not because I've been brainwashed. I just feel like <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of missing targets. So, so you know. mentioned that this is a position that you would even double, maybe even triple up on in the draft. Are there any mid to late round guys that you've particularly got your eye on that look like they would be a good fit with this team? Absolutely. Um, I mentioned one in Dwayne Estridge um, out of Western Michigan. I just think uh, he provides that speed element. Um I mean, this guy is, is tough as nails. He was a gunner, you know, on, on punt, on punt, uh, and you know, he's a returner. He just provides a lot of things. He's he's a tough. He's a football player. Um, and then you look at maybe day three guys like Cornell Powell, built okay. more, built more in the mode. He's out of Clemson. He's built more in the mode of an AJ Brown. But um, you know, you can scheme some good things for him in terms of uh, you know, shot plays down the field so he can use his body to for positioning and make plays in that fashion. 
um, you know, Tennessee's own, you know, here, Josh Palmer, he's another guy that I really, I really like as well. He balled at the senior bowl. Um, you know, people watch the Alabama tape. Um, yeah. he, gave, he gave Patrick Sertang some, some pretty good reps there. Um, um, he gave who else? Tyson Campbell some pretty good reps against Georgia. So I guess the best he's, he's provided, you know, he's, he's ball. Um, who's another guy? I'm not going to say Nico Collins. <laughs> <laughs> you can say knows. Nico Collins. I'm not, I'm not right. hating. I'm just saying. Right. For sure. Everybody knows about Nico Collins for this, for the, for the, before the end of the week, they'll know about Nico Collins. But, <laughs> um, um, let's see another guy I really like, cause I want to give you another one. Um, Amari Rogers is, is very intriguing because when I was watching him, I almost wanted to throw him at running back. I mean, it's, it's so yeah. difficult. It's so difficult to tackle him. He reminds me so much of Debo Samuel. I mean, I'm not sure many players can tackle him one on one because of how he's built, how he just breaks tackles. It's, it's kind of crazy. But those those players I really really like in terms of day two prospects and uh, possibly day three. So, how do you feel about the the cornerback position for the Titans? Do you think Jack Rabbit's addition was enough? Uh, because I look at the cornerback position and think they they still need a guy in that rotation, if not a day one starter. What do you think about this crop of, of cornerbacks and how badly do the Titans need one? Um, they definitely need one. I would say that would rank number two or three on my list. Okay. What they need. I think Jack, Rab Jack Rabbit brings speed. He brings veteran leadership. Um, you know, Kevin Johnson, not a popular uh, free agent signing by most fans, but I think he provides um, some versatility on the back end. So now the Titans need guys that's going to come in and, and, and be more, uh, you know, long-term, you know, yeah. be a fit for long-term. Um, some guys that I like in this draft and where we should take it. I wouldn't take one in the first round. I know a lot of people are, are comping, you know, the Greg Newsom's of the world, or even if Caleb Farley drops to us, um, you know, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a position where it has the depth of wide receiver, but it doesn't have, the potency if that makes sense like mm. um you you can have a certain there's per, certain tiers and there's certain runs where you'll get high caliber guys and then there'll be certain tiers and runs where you'll get meh type of guy sure. um did you want me to elaborate on some of the guys i like or yeah go for it i know a lot of people that are most often mocked to the titans would be greg newsome your caleb farley's i've even seen a couple of people that think for some reason jc horn's going to be there at 22 i think that's that's laughable i think you can call jc horn the best corner in this draft and i ain't going to argue with you on that one. Oh yeah jc horn is my cornerback one um, but the thing just real quick i do want to get in some love for jc horn because mm -hmm. i actually watched him last week myself and just the the nuance of the position that he puts on tape, just knowing when to turn around and look for the ball and, and anticipation of a receiver's route breaking. Like all of these guys are great athletes. All these guys can cover. But to me, that's the thing that really sets him apart from the rest of this draft class is that he's just got that mental intangible stuff that you can't teach and you can't coach easily. He's got it down already. Right, for sure. I mean, he was born to play the position. For me. There you go. You know, from a physical standpoint, from a technical standpoint, and then that mentality that you're talking about, I mean, you, you can't beat that, you know, and he's system versatile, can play man. Um, there's some zone, uh, you know, nuance that he has to learn, you know, positioning a little, you know, in zone situation, but that's easily correctable. But as a man corner, that's where I start my evaluations with corners. J.C. Horn, cornerback one, won't be there at 22. But King, king yeah. stuff, man. Top 10 yeah. pick, perhaps. So oh, yeah. what about uh, Greg Newsom versus Caleb Farley, these two guys? Because it, it seems like both could be more realistic options for the Titans at 22. Absolutely. Um, Caleb Farley is a top three cornerback to me, a win healthy. Um, obviously, the medicals is – is what's going to make him slide and you know for the titans benefit i think that when healthy he is a great coin but does j rob really want to take another risk on a guy that you don't know i don't think he'll live it down you know if, if 
if he if he takes another first round guy that doesn't pan out and this, yeah. you know, this case would be injured um but let's just say he doesn't get injured you know you're going to get a top three corner um tall one of the most physical cornerbacks in this draft um you know he doesn't panic either down the field um he's more of a zone guy so you'll see him cover three and then you know one-on-one situations but when the ball's in the air he's one of the most calm cool and collected guys that i've you know seen so um and then when you move to greg Newsom, i'm, I'm going to be honest i don't necessarily see a first round guy i see more of a early second round guy uh, he's one of the best zone corners in this draft but there's some minor technical de- deficiencies that he has as a man guy um, and his size and he's had some injury issues as well he's a player that you talk about his injury issues um nobody's bringing it up because it didn't happen in 2020 you know um, mm. he's had you know he had, he started as many games as he's missed I believe so that I mean when you look at those numbers you know half the time he's injured half the time he's available so Titans are in a tough position. That's why I say cornerback can wait because there's other guys like Eric Stokes, you know, from Georgia, Tyson Campbell, Elijah Molden. They're so it's so rich after the first round that you don't have to necessarily take one that early. You had a really interesting tweet about Greg Newsom uh, not too long ago about people always talking about his fluid hips and how he turns and goes with coverage, and everybody's raving about that, but you're the one that that stands up and says, hold on a second, guys. If he's turning his hips so much, he's going to get beat in the NFL. Absolutely. Um, it's, you know, and I'll, I just chalk that up as, you know, them not necessarily understanding the cornerback position. I played the cornerback position, uh, you know, I was at the high school level, could have went to college, but, you know, that's a different story. Um, um, but an all district corner, I know enough and I watched the game enough to know that that means that, yes, you're showing an athletic movement by opening up your hips. That's great. You, at least you're not stiff. But the very fact that you're letting a <laughs> wide receiver, you're letting a wide receiver and look at the competition on some of those uh, video clips that they're showing. The wide receiver that's guarding him is not even going to be an NFL wide receiver. So you're allowing a future doctor, lawyer, gym teacher, no disrespect. You're, let, uh, you're allowing them to get you turned around. So guess what, you know, Keenan Allen is going to do? Guess what yeah. Stephon Diggs is going to do? He's going to embarrass you. He's yeah. going to be picked on probably early. But that's what I mean by the man thing, the man deficiencies. Once he gets yeah. that figured out, yes, he will be a good guy. But early on, if he doesn't figure it out, he's going to be picked on <laughs> for sure. I'll give you props for that one, man. I have been rethinking Greg Newsom ever since I saw that tweet. That that shit has just been in my my head rent free ever since I saw you post that. So uh, if if the Titans do indeed go receiver in the first round and they can wait until later on in the draft to address the cornerback position, give me some more deep cuts on that side of the ball. Got you. Uh, so like I said a, a little bit ago, uh, Eric Stokes um, from Georgia. I think he's a guy. You watch tape, and initially you see a smaller guy. He got a little bigger over the process, which is what you expect guys to do, identify the weaknesses. So he definitely gets an extra boost for me. He identified a weakness, got a little bigger. Um, The measurements show he's a little longer than you think. Um, You can put him in a Titan scheme because he's a sufficient man corner. He understands leverage and zone. He understands how to pattern pattern read, Um, and he has a dog in him. And I think – yeah. I actually have my notes of Eric Stokes that I remember um, that at every category of cornerback, he was a top five for me. So zone, man, mentality, speed, recovery. You know, obviously, you know, if those were closer to one, he'd be competing with J.C. Horn, but he was more so in the four or five range. So, um, but he's an all-around corner that I, and smart, smart as heck. Yeah, I think he'd be perfect for the Titans. Defense, another guy is Elijah Molden out of Washington, he, he kind of has similar traits. Um, the only thing is he, he provides a little bit more ability as a safety, which that's not a bad thing, um, and, and size. You know, he's a little on the short side, a little bit, a little bit diminutive. But other than that, man, he's a dog as well. Um, you want him closer to the line of scrimmage or in the slot. Um, another guy, Tyson Campbell out of Georgia as well. Um, uh, height, weight, speed guy, big, physical. He's not as NFL ready as the other two mentioned, 
but if, if he gets it all together, he could have like, uh, you know, the type of production that we think a Patrick Sertan might have because Ooh, he has okay. that build. Um, he has that build. He has that more elongated type of body. Um, and then later on in the draft, you might look at guys like Trey Brown out of Oklahoma, who was a pest at the senior bowl. His tape shows a, a, he has return ability. Um, and uh, another guy that I really like is Paul Adebo. Uh, yeah. Out of Stanford. Mm -hmm. He reminds me a lot of Logan Ryan, incredibly intelligent. Um, he, he isn't as athletically gifted as the other corners mentioned, but, you know, he's a guy that can come in and, and you can trust him to take on a lot because he's going to be able to, you know, process things. There it is. There it is. So is it safe to say that should the Titans end up with Elijah Moore and Eric Stokes as their first two picks, Titans fans should be doing cartwheels? Elijah Moore and and Elijah Mogan or Eric Elijah Stokes? Moore and Eric Stokes. Okay. Uh, Cause I get the Elijah's mixed up sometimes. There's, uh, there's a couple of them in this draft. Right. For sure. For sure. <laughs> if, if the Titans end up with Elijah Moore and Eric Stokes, yes, they should be extremely happy. you got two excellent players or Asante Samuel Jr. I didn't mention him. He's another guy yeah. that is an absolute dog. Love him in zone more, more so in man, um, you know, that jump ball or like I like to call the moment of truth plays doesn't matter. And I know as a, as a, as a, as a smaller corner, smaller corner, um, you know, in those 50, 50 moments, it doesn't matter if you're a good corner, if the guy's six, four, you know, you can try to yeah. time it, but sometimes those moments of truth plays is, is what it is. But um, yeah, if the Titans get those two players, they're on the smaller side, but you got, you got you some dogs. So you should definitely be happy. About so those. something that we've kind of, danced around on the show so far We're talking about the needs saying that they they need wide receiver uh, more than they need a cornerback in this draft how do you how do you balance the value and the needs uh, you said something interesting earlier where uh, the cornerback class is is deep but it might not be as potent as wide receiver so with that first round pick how do you kind of balance that when making your decision um you you kind of another nerdy thing is you kind of you kind of started this way back in January or February when you were looking at your free agency class and then you compared and you watched tape and you saw what was in the draft and then when you do that you're able to financially you know dis, discern where you should go um, for example um, you knew that the wide receiver position was deep in the draft if mm -hmm. you know that by watching tape you know it's very talented why would you pay a free agent wide receiver anything more than three or four million? If you know that, you know, the draft is going to be deep with talent and it's potent, um, you know, and with edge rusher, for instance, the edge rushers in this class are inexperienced. You can't mm -hmm. trust them really. You know, you don't know. That's why in my game plan, I went heavy veteran edge rushers. Um, and I, I didn't care about the dollar amount as much as the production. Um, and then, you know, as far as this draft, when you talk about, okay, what should we go wide receiver corner? You just look at when you do the tape study, you just know that, okay, I can get a guy that, um, and it's, and sometimes it just comes down to who you feel is better as a person. Sometimes you like people or you, or you've heard of my guy lists. Um, all that comes into play, but when I talk about, okay, should we take a cornerback in the first round? when I know that the second round will have a good run of corners, why would I take, why would I take a cornerback that I feel pressured to take? Like right now, the pressure seems to be Caleb Farley. You know, yeah. to be honest. Because when you look at your tape study, Caleb Farley is my top three. And, but he, in this, but, but he has injuries. Now nah, I'd rather take Elijah Moore, who, you know, I mentioned he's probably the Eric Stokes, of wide receivers he he's he can play him outside but you prefer him to be in a slot smooth catcher smooth route runner can can um you know stretch the defense he just has more you know he he, he provides you with variance and you know the more that you can do as you've heard that saying as well the more that, that you can do the better um it's really a lot of draft evaluation is about your gut feel as well but once you pair your gut feel with the work that you've done with tape, tape study and measuring the pros and cons, it just kind of how your board stacks will tell you. 
Yeah. And I think the, the flow of the draft is going to impact that as well, you know, because we can sit here and, and talk about it until we're blue in the face, but you just don't know how the dominoes are going to fall until they start falling. So I right. think that factors into the equation too. And, and people try to simplify this, this uh, topic of discussion when really it's pretty complicated, pretty nuanced. And there are a lot of, a lot of variables in this one. So some interesting yeah. thoughts there. Uh, let's go beyond cornerback and wide receiver. The idea of the Titans taking a defensive lineman in the first round of this draft because of potentially some corners being gone, some receivers being gone, maybe the value not being there. You're starting to see some of that, that, that maybe a guy like Christian Barmore might be the pick at 22. This isn't the, the deepest defensive line draft. So if they're going to get a guy like Christian Barmore, do you think they got to get him in the first round or is there somebody else out there? Um, it depends on what they're trying to accomplish when you look at the, the vacancies on the depth chart. So, you know, we signed the Nico Archer, who's more of that. Um, he's going to play three technique and then sometimes, you know, at five technique. So more so over guard, over off, out, uh, offensive tackle. You need a nose. You need a guy that can be in the middle of those two, whether it be Danico Autry to his left, uh, Jeffrey Simmons to his right, and a guy that can push the pocket, demand double teams. And one of my favorite prospects in this draft, my nose tackle one is Aline McNeil out of North Carolina State, where I feel as though he can go as early as that spot where the Titans will be in the second round or in the third round. Um, so I really think the Titans need a, a nose tackle. Okay. Now, when we talk about Barmore, I think that's a good value pick because he is my number one rated defensive tackle overall. Um, has pass rush skills that not many defensive tackles have. Um, his length, um, his long arm. Um, only thing with him is the you know you got a one another one year wonder. Right? Sure, we don't really know um, about that. He needs some coaching. Um, one year average above average production i should say and i'm looking at my notes because i want to be very specific on this um he, he plays high most of the time driven back versus run um so you know he's more of the guy that is that freakish pass rush talent and just needs coaching to practice his leverage and his um ability versus the run so when you're weighing that, that you're just getting the guy that you're gonna have to coach up and you're gonna get yeah. pass rush, push pass rush talent but I like Aleem McNeil in the second or third round, um, depending on how the draft goes. And Aleem McNeil is an athletic and versatile guy. Um, so I think that would really fit the Tennessee Titans front seven. I've seen Zayvon Collins mentioned as a potential target for the Titans a couple of times too. And I got to say, man, he's one of my favorite prospects in this draft because I think he can do a lot more than people are giving him credit for. People just talk about his freak athleticism and say he's an edge rusher. But if you watch what Tulsa did with him, they used him a lot to just block passing lanes and he spied on opposing quarterbacks. And he's really kind of, um, he, he looks like a, a more complete player than people are giving him credit for for uh, what do you think about him as a prospect and if if he's the pick at number 22 i mean i'm gonna read off my notes again a versatile three four inside linebacker he's a sam mike and will in a four three he's long great closing speed he's zone proficient secures tackles potential as an edge rusher fluid in coverage i mean Boom. <laughs> wow there you go yeah this guy can play everywhere um Things that I didn't like necessarily is not refined as an edge yet. He needs some coaching. He's crafty. He's crafty enough, but will he evade offensive tackles in space, which I think he will. Um, he did bulk up to 270, so that might be something directed by a coach or how he feels about himself. Maybe he wants to try edge more. But if he does get back to around that 255, 260 range, I mean, you can play this guy everywhere. I mean, yeah. he kind of were, honestly – he reminds me of Carlos Dansby of those that remember a good a oh, tall, man. lanky coverage type of linebacker. But then in some ways, he kind of reminds me with his intelligence when you watch his interviews, reminds me like of a Mike Vrabel. So I think that could be an interesting selection at 22 um, because I feel like he, he might just drop there. So um, I know that Mike Vrabel will have a field day by having a guy like Zayden Collins because you can do so much with him. Um, so, I wouldn't be opposed to the pick. 
like I said, I feel like people are oversimplifying him because of his athleticism and calling him an edge rusher, even though there's not a real precedent for that because Tulsa didn't really use him as a pure off the edge rusher. So I don't think this is my hot take. You can tell me if I'm out of line on this one. If you're drafting Zayvon Collins at 22, if you're the Tennessee Titans, you're not doing it because you want pass rush help. You're doing it because you're planning for the departure of Rashawn Evans and or Jayon Brown. Do you think that's crazy to say? That is not crazy. That is actually very sane. You're sane. I'll take it. Yes, absolutely. That's a win today. That's a win for – put one in the column for Stoney today. I got that okay. one. Absolutely. I mean, the guy can play the position. Um, like I said, I mean, you can literally – it's so much versatility. Like, you know, he can be a replacement at that inside linebacker uh, position. And then, obviously, if you find another guy later in the draft that you like better – you can literally have two in a three, four, you can have two um, inside linebacker guys and then and have him at egg situationally on third down or whatever you want to do. I mean, the possibilities are endless with Zay. Mm-hmm. I think that's what makes him a, a, an interesting prospect. So Tevin Jenkins, we're going to talk O-line a little bit. Tevin Jenkins has popped up on several mocks for the Titans. Uh, personally, I don't have any issues with him as a prospect. I think he is one of the better right tackles in this class, but I kind of feel like Nashville is going to riot if this team (laughs) goes with a right tackle in the first round a year after the Isaiah Wilson debacle. What do you think about Jenkins as a prospect? And what do you think about the idea of the Titans going right tackle in round one? Um, I don't like it. I don't like the... uh, I'm, I'm with you. It's like the Tennessee Titans were able to have the one of the top offenses ever in their history last year and they didn't have a a, 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 you know a blue chip right tackle when they did it um that's not something that you want to do every year but they were able to do it you just need a sufficient guy that's going to go out there and protect the quarterback and open lanes for your running back so why would you take that position in the first round at, at, at really any point unless he's that guy and to me Tevin Jenkins as physical as he is as a as a defender and destroyer he is he still has some athletic limitations that I sure. don't I don't agree with I have you know a second round mid second round grade on him so to take him in the first would be you know not very not very smart in my opinion um, I think you can get right tackle help in the in day two or day three i'm with you man all on board with that idea so i want to ask you about two more positions on this team and then i'll I'll give you your evening back and we'll we'll cut loose for a little bit on this fine monday i want to ask you about the linebacker position because it's uncertain Uh, we don't know about rashawn evans's future in nashville we don't know about Jayon brown beyond 2021 what do you think about the idea of the Titans really getting a contingency plan in place for, for the inside linebacker positions, either one, out of this draft class? Um, I think it's definitely on their radar. Um, depending on how the board stacks, they could they could do it earlier than some people think. But I think there's a, some day three talent that they can get. Um, really like Buddy Johnson out of Mississippi State. Um, he's a guy that people can certainly look up. Um, one of the top rated linebackers versus the run. Um, he's not as, as he's not the coverage guy that Jayon Brown is, but you know, he can stick his nose in there and uh, stop the run. Uh, another guy's Nick Neiman out of Iowa. Um, he's a guy that's extremely, extremely intelligent, read and react type of guy. He's going to find the ball. And when he, then he, when he goes, when he finds you, he's going to be pissed off. Um, yeah. So I think that when you look at, prospects that's going to be available to Tennessee Titans will have a chance and it's going to come down to what they want do they want a heat-seeking missile or do they want another guy like Jayon Brown which is going to be hard to find in this draft sure what do you think about Nick Bolton out of Missouri because he's a name that's that's popped up several times from uh Titans fans and I haven't really dug into him a whole lot but he seems to be a popular choice for one of those mid-round snags for the Titans Um, Bolton is linebacker two or three for me. Um, you put on the table, he's, more, he's more of an old school guy. Yeah. Um, more of an old school type of player throwback. Um, reminds me of, you know, a more, 
uh, a more athletic Stephen Tulloch. I think, you know, if, if Titans fans remember Stephen Tulloch. I was about to say, that's, that's going to make a lot of people in Nashville, longtime Titans fans, happy to hear that comparison. Absolutely. Um, he's just a super physical player, reads everything well. Like I said, you're, you're, missing the, you're missing out a little bit in the coverage perspective, but when you, usually when you have those type of players, it's very difficult to find guys that can really cover. And that's what you're losing with him, his coverage ability. But other than that, versus the run, he's a great leader. Um, he, he checks off a lot of bo your boxes because, I mean, SEC talent. And when, in those big games, he was, a, he was a player that definitely emerged in those games. You could see he belonged. You know, he's out of Missouri, more, more of the more sm smaller, lesser known. But definitely he performed well versus SEC, SEC talent. And that's what you really want to see. There you have it. Lastly, I want to ask you about the tight end class in this year's draft. Um, I feel like John U. Smith is leaving behind a bigger hole than a lot of people realize because he, he did do a lot of things pretty well for the Titans. But this class looks like it's just Kyle Pitts and everybody else. And I've actually written that I think I don't think it's going to be a surprise if the Titans don't draft a tight end at all. And maybe they bring in a free agent after the draft because this class just looks like a bunch of projects to me. What's your take on this class? And do you see anybody worth taking there in those mid to late rounds for the Titans to develop? Um, I would have to agree. It's not a phenomenal uh, draft class, um, but I do like, like a couple guys um, that I'm almost sure that they'll have John Lee Smith type production, maybe not the athlete that he is, but you got to kind of separate the two when it comes to John Lee. We didn't use him as much as we should, uh, should have. Um, but two guys come to mind, and that's Brevin Jordan out of Miami, mm -hmm. Trey McKitty um, out of Georgia, and he spent most of his time at FSU, but last year at Georgia. Um, those two guys can provide similar production to what John Lee did. In fact, Brevin Jordan is often comped to John Smith. Um, when you look at the measurables, they're nowhere near when you talk about the actual numbers, but the way he plays the game, very similar. Similarly, um, great run after catch, a willing blocker. He's smart as crap. This guy, I mean, you get him in an interview, he you know, articulates himself well, and then he has that dog mentality as well. Um, he isn't long. You know, he's not going to have many out-of-frame catches. Um, and that's juxtaposed to Trey McKitty, who's more long. Um, very underrated player because he doesn't have the production, like he doesn't have the numbers, Trey McKitty. Um, but the guy at the senior bowl was beating everybody um, on his one-on-ones. Guy had several one-handed catches. I mean, he has huge mitts, underrated route runner, just underrated overall. Um, my comp for him was Jared Cook, but a more physical Jared Cook. So um, that's another Titans uh, yeah, I was about Titans. to say, so, yeah, I mean, Titans fans ears perked up hearing that too. Absolutely. So I think those two guys, you know, Pat, Pat for our muse, people, people love him, call him baby Gronk. And, and you know, <laughs> I, I kind of, I kind of have to laugh at that because, you know, I don't think there'll be another Gronk for quite some time. Um, but he, he's more of a Heath Miller type of guy that I think if he stays healthy, he looks like a guy that kind of plays um, reckless and, Usually players like that, they, they get they are often injured. Yeah. Um, you got the Hunter Longs of the world, John Bates, Sean Byer, all of those are clumped together as guys that you're gonna have to do some work with, you know. So do you really want to waste the pick on the developmental guy, or do you want, you know, sure things out of position that you, you know, feel very secure, obviously, because you didn't tag John Smith. So yeah. so, you know, it I, I I agree with you. It's very possible that the Titans might feel comfortable enough to say, okay, we're good with Berkshire and, you know, Swain, and we'll, we'll just ride with these guys. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you combine the two and you've got the production from John Smith. You can put in Swain to block and you can put in Ferkser to catch. You just got to work with two guys instead of just leaving Johnu in there all the time. But I, I would be really surprised if the Titans spent uh, an early pick on a tight end this year because of just how uncertain the class looks. Well, Charles, that's going to do it for us, man. I appreciate you hopping on this call with me and diving into this draft class a little bit. Before we get out of here for this episode, let our listeners know once again how they can get in touch with you on social media and where they can find your work. 
Absolutely. Uh, on Twitter and Instagram, it's at BU underscore scouting. Um, Facebook, Charles Barnes, if, you, if you're into that. <laughs> and uh, throughout this week, just going to be releasing rankings, everything Titans and draft related. Um, and I'm looking forward to the draft like everybody else. I'm going to watch it all three days, probably from start to finish per usual and uh, have fun with it. What do you what do you have planned for Thursday night? Are you going to be doing something special or are you just going to be uh, holed up in the office watching? I got invited by Teron Davenport to to go to um, an event that he's having where he's going to do coverage. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to have to uh, be at home with with my family. Um, these people take up all my time. Um, <laughs> For sure. Yeah, they take, up, they take up a lot of my time. Um, Friday, I'm going to have to go to a, 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 a non-football business event, but I should go live talking about the draft, um, as I've done in the, the past couple of years. And Saturday is going to be my probably more flexible day, so I'm not sure what I'll do then. But yeah, um, it's going to be fun. I mean, I love this time. I'm, I mean, I, I'm kind of probably crazy for watching it all three days from start to finish, too. I'm not sure many people do that. I, I'm with you, man. I do the same thing. Like I, I'm getting pizza delivered. I ain't leaving the house. So we're, I'm going to sit, there's going to be a, a hole the size of my butt in the couch by the time the weekend's over with, cause I've just been on it so much. All right. So yeah, you suffer from the same disease as me. I do. And I'm like breaking down. It's like round seven and they're drafting people I've never even heard of that are just <laughs> popping up that nobody nobody had scouted you know there's always that four or five guys that everybody's just like what is this and i'm googling these dudes trying to find film on them and stuff like that so right. uh yeah it's um it kind of feels like a an addiction of sorts the nfl draft it is man yeah and yeah. i agree with you man i watch as many prospects as I, as I can and then day seven you see a guy you know dakota fleming out of st louis <laughs> st louis <laughs> St. Louis Community College or something, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. Who is this guy? But yeah, man, it is it is an addiction. But you know, I love it. You love it. So that's why we're here, man. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. That's why we do what we do. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Barnes on the unofficial Titans podcast. We're gonna get out of here. Uh, be sure to follow me on Twitter at Stony Keeley. Follow us collectively at Titans Pod on Twitter and at Sobros Network on all major social media platforms. If you feel like watching the NFL draft along with the Sobros team, I think Stephen McCash and Outspoken Owen both are going to join me on Thursday night for a live stream on at Sobros Network, all the main platforms, Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube. Watch along and react in real time with us. Be sure to check out all of our work at SobrosNetwork.com. You can support the team through Patreon at Patreon.com slash SobrosNetwork and subscribe to the Unofficial Titans podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you take in your shows. We are out there. Give us a rate and review when you have a moment. That's how we get better, and we always want to be better for you guys. For Charles Barnes, I am Stoney Keeley, and until next time, you stay classy, Titans fans.